The Mandelbrot set is probably the most iconic picture in all of math. It's honestly amazing seeing how a tiny piece of code can generate such an intricate object. The mysticality of zooming into areas never gets old. Today, let's look at something that adds to its mysteriousness. But first, it might be helpful to recall what the Mandelbrot set even is. We start in the complex plane. And actually, let's zoom in a bit, the real magic happens in this area. We then consider a complex number c and define a function f of z is equal to z squared plus c. So for instance, if I choose c is equal to negative 1 plus i, it gives us the function f of z is equal to z squared plus negative 1 plus i. After that, start with z is equal to 0 and calculate f of z. Then plug this number back into f of z and keep repeating. So you can see how for some certain choices of c, the number explodes to infinity. Like in this case with c is equal to negative 1 plus i, after a few steps it's way off the plane. But for some others, it stays constrained. So for instance, with c is equal to negative 0.25 plus 0.25i, it actually converges to one point. We color these pixels that stay constrained black and consider them part of the Mandelbrot set. As for the others, we color them based off how many steps it takes to blow up, giving us a nice gradient effect. The most intricate part about the Mandelbrot set is the behavior around the edges. Here, consider the point negative 0.75. Since this point is contained in the Mandelbrot set, we know that f of z should remain bounded. But it's right at the border of the set, meaning that if I take a small step upwards, so negative 0.75 plus epsilon i for some small number epsilon, it should blow up. And actually, it can be shown that if the number ever reaches a magnitude of 2, it blows up to infinity. OK, now let's count the number of steps it takes to reach a magnitude of 2 for some epsilon. If epsilon is equal to 1, it takes 3 steps. If epsilon is equal to 0 0.1, 33 steps. Nothing out of the ordinary. But if I keep going, 0 0.01, 315 steps, 0 0.001, 3143 steps, and so on. Well, notice a pattern? These are the digits of pi. This was mind-blowing to me. It makes zero intuitive sense why this should be a thing. The earliest posting of this I could find was from 1991 by Dave Boll on Google Groups. Remember that? In 2001, Aaron Klebanoff published a paper going into why this phenomenon occurs and the math behind it. And actually, this also happens at the point 0.25, except using negative powers of 100 instead of 10. What I want to show you today is an explanation for why this occurs, which happens to be surprisingly short. The underlying lesson here is that of limiting behavior. For ease of illustration, let's consider the behavior at the point 0.25. The reasoning for both negative 0.75 and 0.25 is pretty much the same though. What makes 0.25 easier is the fact that our epsilon isn't going in the direction of the imaginary axis, but rather in the real axis. This means that our outputs and inputs are constrained to the real numbers, allowing us to plot things in the Cartesian plane. The Mandelbrot update function at 0.25 is f of z is equal to z squared plus 0.25. Since we only care about the real inputs and outputs, we can plot it as a parabola. Remember, we start with z is equal to 0, then calculate f of 0, then plug that back into f and so on. But what does this look like on the coordinate plane? Well, let's start at the origin, represented by this blue dot here. Then we can calculate f of 0, setting the y coordinate of the dot to f of 0. This has the same effect visually as moving up until we hit the parabola. After this, we set the input to be equal to the output, or the x-coordinate equal to the y-coordinate, which has the same effect as moving right until we hit the line y is equal to x. And then we repeat, giving us a nice sort of bouncing effect.
Remember, what we're dealing with is the number of steps it takes to blow up to infinity. If you remember, 0.25 happens to be inside the Mandelbrot set, so it never blows up to infinity. Since each step corresponds to two collisions here, you can imagine that we're looking for some formula that gives the number of times the blue dot touches the line y is equal to x. What's special about this parabola is that the line y is equal to x is actually tangent to the parabola at x is equal to 1 half. If we think of the Mandelbrot update as this bouncing line, we can see that it just gets stuck at the tangent point, and that's where the bounded outputs come from. But if I were to add some epsilon to this value, giving us the function f of z is equal to z squared plus 0.25 plus epsilon, the effect is to shift this parabola a teeny bit up, such that y is equal to x is no longer tangent. Now, our Mandelbrot calculations no longer get stuck. They go on to infinity. The main lesson today is likely one you've seen in many contexts. As a discrete case gets smaller and smaller, it approaches that of a continuous one similar to how Riemann sums approach an integral. But my point is that sometimes it shows up in places you would not expect, such as this one. So, notice that the majority of the collisions happen around the point x is equal to 1 half, which was where the line used to be tangent. So, to make the calculations easier, let's shift the entire parabola down into the left, replacing z with z plus 0.5 and subtracting 0.5 from the function. Simplifying, this gives us f of z is equal to z squared plus z plus epsilon. Well, now let's rewrite, since considering the function as just a parabola is kind of missing the point. What it really is, is an update function that gives us the next step in our calculation. Let's denote the ith step z sub i, replacing f of z with the next step, z sub n plus 1, and replacing z with the current step, z sub n. This gives us z sub n plus 1 is equal to z sub n squared plus z sub n plus epsilon, and the initial step, z sub naught, is equal to 0. For the next step, let's actually move z sub n to the other side, giving us z sub n plus 1 minus z sub n on the left hand. Now what happens as epsilon tends to 0? Remember this visual earlier with the parabola shifting down? Notice how as epsilon tends to 0, Around the point 1 half 1 half, the difference between the step z sub n and the step z sub n plus 1 gets smaller and smaller. In our equation, this point is actually 0, 0 because we shifted everything down into the left, but the same idea applies. Visually, you can think of this as the number of collisions around this point increasing and increasing. And as epsilon tends to 0, two things happen. Since most of the collisions happen around this point, we can consider all the collisions to happen around this point. And also, about this point, the step size between each collision does tend to zero, so the discrete update tends to a smooth function. And furthermore, z sub n plus 1 minus z sub n corresponds to a tiny change in this function, in other words, the derivative. And so, we have the differential equation z prime is equal to z squared plus epsilon. But let's take a step back, what exactly are we solving for what is z of n? While assuming our smoothed out function with epsilon tending to 0, z sub n gives the value of the Mandelbrot function at the nth step. Solving this equation, we get z sub n is equal to root epsilon tan root epsilon n. Remember though, we shifted everything to the point 1 half 1 half, meaning that n is equal to 0 corresponds to 1 half 1 half. What we're looking for is the total number of steps. In other words, we go left forever and calculate the total number of steps, which you can imagine as going down and to the left on the Cartesian plane, and add that to going right forever and calculating the total number of steps, which you can imagine as going up and to the right on the Cartesian plane. And since the tangent function has poles, the total number of steps converges to this strip, which is pi over root epsilon. And there you have it, as epsilon tends to zero, the total number of steps approaches pi over root epsilon. The root epsilon instead of epsilon is the reason why around the point 0.25, pi appears at powers of 100 and not 10. 
And also, since pi over root epsilon is the limiting behavior here, we can only expect the number of steps to approximate pi. If we look at some values here, you can see some of the last digits seem to be off. Today's video was a different one. Instead of presenting some math concept, I've shown you a seemingly useless yet cool observation. But who cares if it's useless? Math is all about intellectual curiosity and playing around. So next time you learn something new, play around with it. Take out a piece of paper, pull out some Python, and try some calculations. See if you can uncover some cool patterns. Me personally, I had so much fun playing around with OpenGL and creating these graphs. I think it's one of the best ways to engage with material and develop interest in it. Thanks for watching. When I was working on this video, one of the ideas I had was to use a cluster with a bunch of GPUs in the cloud to make rendering these fractals real time. Instead though, I decided to go with spending more time on optimizing my current solution in order to allow it to run on my current setup. I believe that small things like this really do add up on helping climate change, which takes me to today's sponsor, REN. REN is a simple way to do your part. You start by calculating your carbon footprint and answering a few questions about your lifestyle. Then you can offset your carbon footprint by making a monthly contribution to fund various projects. The two projects that stuck out to me the most are Biocar in California, which removes dead and flammable trees from California forests in order to prevent forest fires, and Clean Task Air Force, which advocates for policies to reduce the cost of zero emission technologies, which might help with the servers I was talking about earlier. So if you're interested, go to the link in the description and sign up. The first 100 people who sign up will have 10 trees planted in their name.